Catherine Gray. Hi. Hi. Hey, it's so, so excited good to, to see be you. here. Yes. We're gonna we're gonna over talk each other the whole time I can tell because we're both excited. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, okay. First question before we start the actual interview. Um, if you are what you eat, what are you? And are you having any pregnancy cravings? <gasps> oh my gosh. Okay. Uh <laughs> If I am what I eat, then I'm a croissant. Ah. <laughs> I just keep eating them. I, I'm, I'm not normally obsessed with bread, but I'm obsessed with bread in yeah. pregnancy. And yes. also um, had a brief interlude where, uh, do, you, do you have Hawaiian pizza in the oh, States? Oh, yeah. Yes. Like with ham and pineapple. Yes. And <laughs> I, I ordered a Hawaiian pizza, which is the first Hawaiian pizza I've had since I was about 12. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> yeah, there's been some strange things. That's, I, I think that's a legitimate pregnancy thing, like pineapple and ham, the sweet and the salty. Yeah. You know, that kind of strong, thing with the cheese. Yeah. I want strong flavors and bread. Yeah. yeah. And bread. Don't forget the bread. Yes. Yeah. Don't for forget sure. the bread. On bread. Strong flavors know, on right? bread. <laughs> where, where are you in England, Catherine? I'm in Brighton, which is an hour south of London on the okay. coast. It's lovely here. On the coast. That's what you said. Yeah. 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 So, um, is, is it, is it a, a, like a smaller, is it a small town or is it a proper city? Like, what is it? It's a city, but only just, um, a lot of people call it mini London by the sea because ah, <laughs> it's okay. just as expensive, but it's, it's really a lovely place to be. It's nice. kind of like, um, I guess it would be your, your equivalent of Carmel or Santa Barbara or somewhere like that. It's very okay. holiday vibes and beautiful. Yeah. Lovely. That's really lovely. So now I can picture you getting your croissant and your Hawaiian pizza <laughs> and your, in your hamlet by the sea. Um, th thank you. Thank you for that. I am Laura Cathcart Robbins. This is the only one in the room, but I'm never the only one in this room because as usual, my boyfriend, producer, and co-host Scott Slaughter, who I call Hun, is here as well. Hi, honey. Hey, honey. Um, so we are talking to my friend, Catherine Gray, mm -hmm. um, who is the Sunday Times bestselling author of the Unexpected Joy series of books, of which there are many. And um, I want to talk about all of her books and everything that she does and is. But I want to just um, mention a couple of things first before we even get into the interview. Um, one, we were just trying to remember exactly how we got connected. And, um, you know, it's it's one of those roads that leads back to Holly Whitaker. Again. Who is, yes, again. <laughs> <laughs> who has, of course, been on the show um, more than once and is Catherine's friend and my friend. And um, she is just a great connector. So I just wanted to shout her out. Um, and I'm going to hold up this book. For those of you who aren't watching this, I'm holding up a book called Sunshine Warm Sober by Catherine Gray. This is your latest book, right, Catherine? Yeah, of which yeah. in 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 which there is a brilliant essay by you. <laughs> there, <laughs> by thank the way. you. Thank it you. Is a good a really, one. I, I really like that one. And, and I'm in the super. acknowledgments, hon. At the end, she put me in the acknowledgments. Of course As you, you should are. be, honey. Oh, yeah. this is so cool. It's the first time I've ever been in the acknowledgments in any book. So I was <laughs> I'll very put you in excited. all my acknowledgments from now on. <laughs> oh, good. Good. I'll put you in mine. <laughs> Even if you don't do uh, anything. Yes. <laughs> um, but thank you for that. And thank you for including me in this gorgeous book. Um, I read it for the On My Nightstand series and, and you and I did a Zoom and I just kept feeling the book because it's so smooth and wonderful and you just want to like rub it on your face. I think I did that when <laughs> you did. <laughs> Don't put it, it in again. My um, you, so yeah, the outside it. of the book is incredible. The inside is even better. Beautiful stories, um, and we'll we'll talk about what sunshine, warm, sober means too in a minute. But um, and I want to talk about sobriety with you because that's just so much fun, and um, it's it's something you know that you and I have in common. It's the first thing that we had in common, but. I want to I want to first talk about um, you at well getting pregnant after age 40. Um, so in the U.S., right, in 2017, the birth rate fell to a record low, except for mm -hmm. mothers 
over 40 and over 45, especially, they held steady. So it wow. seems, yeah, right? It seems to point to a trend of some kind. And were, were you someone who always knew they wanted to have kids? No, not at all. I mean, no. I, I didn't want children. I actively didn't want children you from didn't. the ages of about 34 to 39. And I think the thing that for me that really triggered um, the urge to be a mother was finally getting myself sorted and yeah. finally feeling like I'd grown up a little bit and I had a stable, you know, I bought my, my own place aged 39, 40. I finally had some savings for the first time in my life. <laughs> yeah. Before I was just like spending all the money as fast mm-hmm. as I can. <laughs> and I did a lot of work around because I, I assumed I was going to be a bad mother as well because um, I have lots of personality traits that, would suggest such Mm. you know I like my alone time my favorite thing to do is read and travel and uh, you know go for long bike rides and things like that these are not compatible with motherhood Um, and I did a lot of therapy which led me to see that that wasn't necessarily the case Um, so Mm. those things combined activated and triggered this urge to be a mother at 39 but of course before that in my 20s and early 30s, I just wanted to be a mother because everyone assumes that you should want to be a mother. Right, I didn't right. even it's, really it's think expected. it through. It's expected, yeah. Yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think there's there's some judgment around women who don't want to be mothers. Um, yeah. That there's a, um, it's like people are disappointed almost if oh, if women don't want to be mothers. And they think that you're just wrong as well, because I, yeah. I, it's been interesting because I've seen both sides of it now, because for six years, I, I would say to people freely that I didn't want children. Ah. And they would say things like, you'll change your mind, which I found mm. very patronizing. Yes. Um, you'll never know love like it. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, basically, your life is not complete until you experience motherhood and all this, all this sort of thing. And so I think the those who choose to be child free get this quite constantly where right. they're they're led to believe that they've chosen the wrong life, mm. um, which I really disagree with. Just let people do what they want. <laughs> Just leave them yeah, alone. What, why does it matter to you what people yeah. do? Yes, I, yeah. I completely agree. And then, you know, I was thinking, I was so I had my kids, my my boys, my the loves of my life. Um, in 1998 and 1999, respectively. So one year after the other. And I was really shocked um, to find out that because I was scheduled to deliver my my younger son, Justin, um, four months after I turned 35, that they considered it to be a geriatric pregnancy. Yeah. And I, I, I was honestly a little outraged and insulted by that. I didn't like that word at all. Um, so I'm assuming what, what you have, what you're you're in a geriatric pregnancy right now, right? Yeah, although nobody's called me a geriatric mother. Um, no. <laughs> I Thank have God. Seen, so, yeah, I think that <laughs> there was a campaign in the UK last year to do away with that phrase uh, because it's just ridiculously outdated. Yes. Um, and so, but I have seen the acronym AMA on some of my medical notes, which is advanced maternal age. Um ah. But yeah, but nobody's called me geriatric or elderly or, you know, anything like that. Um, so, right. it, yeah, yeah it's, it's been it's been an interesting process because in terms of how I've been treated by medical staff, yes. I've been treated with nothing but respect. Right. Um, which jars with some of my friends experiences who had children at 39 or 40 um, who were treated like they were almost foolish for getting pregnant at that stage in life um but that I have only encountered female medical staff (laughs) right and I think that that the prejudice that they encountered was um from males although obviously that's not exclusive to male doctors um and so I I've had a really good run of it but what has been interesting is that nobody is interested in my partner's age not one ah, <laughs> medical professional has yeah. asked me how old my partner is. Right. And um, 
age affects sperm as well. It affects, yes, it does. It, it affects things like premature childbirth, stillbirth, um, yeah. you know, congenital heart defects, things like that. So an older father means that that's more likely just as much as an older mother. And yet nobody's asked me that question. And I did actually ask one of the midwives and she swiftly dodged. She, <laughs> she sidestepped that. She sidestepped that question. Ah, she did. Yeah. <laughs> she did. I think she could tell that was a that was a, a powder keg of a question. Right. Um, so I think that there is some underlying prejudice that the the mother's age is the only age that matters, which is very <laughs> odd. Sorry, Arlo. Right. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> come here, come here. We knew come he here. was going to bark at some point. <laughs> yeah. He, he's, yeah. So you lied. That's actually your first child right there. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, for real. <laughs> Absolutely. She's my firstborn. Okay. Um, born. So uh, did you do you watch sex, ed- sex Education, Catherine? I have seen maybe two episodes, but I, uh, no, I haven't seen much of it. Because it got honey, an older do, mother. Yes. Honey, do you remember the name of the actress? She's so famous, and I can't remember her name now. I'll find it real quick, though. Okay, thank you, because it's really going to bug me throughout this whole interview. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and she played Agent Scully, and she played um, Margaret Thatcher in The Crown. Mean. Yeah. Um, Gillian and I can't Anderson. Re- Gillian. Yes. yes. Gillian yes. Anderson. Yeah. So she plays an over 40 mother um, yeah. who who gets pregnant without trying to. Um, and, and it's a really interesting storyline because everybody like you described is is very sweet to her. And but there is this there's a, a thing, you know, one or two things that are said occasionally that indicate her age. Like she mm-hmm. has to fill out a different set of forms um, than the mothers under under forty have to fill out at some point. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and so it's this whole, and they don't, you know, they just kind of take you through her journey without making you tr- trying to make you feel sorry for her, but they're yeah. just showing what it's like for her. I I thought it was there's like you... overall air of disapproval, basically. I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've I have encountered that. So um, mm-hmm. there's there's been even though I've had nothing but respect from medical professionals I I have been told so I had one conversation where somebody told me that they didn't think women over women over 40s were supposed to be mothers at all oh oh tell Um, me about that who who had the balls to (laughs) say that to you Uh oh, she I, got I up even, on that. I didn't even fully compute it at the time, and afterwards I was like, ah, that was actually really rude. Like, but did you was... invite their their opinion in? No, 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 no. This it was a very odd conversation, and I think it was born of the fact that um, she had had she had had a painful experience. She'd had a miscarriage ah. at forty one or forty two. Okay, and so um, I think the way that she dealt with that was to tell herself that she wasn't supposed to be a mother because she was over 40. And so she just was projecting that onto me. So I think to give her a break, that's, that's the way that she chose to deal with that trauma. Um, But it was very odd, (laughs) but I do, I do find actually that um, with um, pregnancy in general, people Mm -hmm. do tend to project their experiences onto me. Um, which is interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, come it's here. okay. Come here, I think come here, I think that's here. a really good point, though. I mean, I found that when when I was pregnant, which you know, one the first one was before I was 35. The second one I delivered after I was 35, and but not about my age, but just in general, people projected mm-hmm. their experiences on me. And yeah. I mean, people would cross the room that I didn't know to give me unsolicited advice oh, about yeah. my yet-to-be-born child. <laughs> I have had so much unsolicited advice. I, I had to check my forehead to see that it wasn't stamped on there. Please right. give me unsolicited <laughs> advice. There seems to be something about um, getting pregnant where it's almost like your body is not your own anymore. And yeah. people feel almost like an ownership. or it's Almost like it's public property. That's the best way I would describe it. And uh, there's there's been lots and lots of advice that I haven't invited in and haven't haven't wanted or needed. Um, yes. But then some of it's very welcome too. You know, I think mm-hmm. it's it's important to to learn to, ha- to have a learning mindset and have a growth mindset 
while also being aware of when people force things upon you <laughs> and yeah. the it was interesting the I would have expected that the othering of the, the mother over 40 process would be when I was pregnant but mm-hmm. the most um prejudice I encountered was when I was trying to get pregnant I was going to ask you about that so yeah tell me about that well I had a lot of friends and family who I love dearly um basically treat me like I was foolish and naive trying to get pregnant aged 41 mm-hmm. um I was told to go straight for IVF mm-hmm. um which was again somebody's personal experience um I was told to go straight on a drug called Clomid which is it yeah. stimulates your ovaries and it can lead to higher multiple pregnancies mm-hmm. um and every time I said oh I just want to try naturally for six months just in just to see you know we just mm-hmm. want to see if we can do it naturally before we go down the route of fertility treatment I I've got a lot of um shall we say uh, just people were skeptical <laughs> right and, and right. I can I can understand why because it's very much the narrative that women over 35 are geriatric mothers and their chances of getting pregnant naturally do fall that is absolutely true but it's still also true that it's the norm that you will get pregnant naturally and have a an error-free pregnancy um I said to one my midwife once that I'm just I'm just so lucky you know I'm 41 and everything's gone so smoothly and she said but you're not you're the norm it's just Mm. that we aren't told that we are told the opposite so when you actually look at the figures um Mm -hmm. it's the majority of couples can and do conceive in their early 40s it's just not talked about I think yeah yeah, I think the the traumatic painful experiences are talked about more than the yippee you know we we got pregnant sure naturally and I think that's that's just how it is well it's just like you know we we watch the evening news you'll see two or three car crashes right but you don't see footage of all the people who made it home safely (laughs) Exactly. Right. Exactly. They're not going to show any of that because that's not news. It's yeah. the two or three car crashes and a conclusion from which you can draw traveling by car is dangerous, right? Because we yeah. saw three crashes on the news, but there are, you know, hundreds of thousands or, or more of people in just Los Angeles alone who made it home safely in the same hour. So Absolutely. I think it's the same, right? Yeah. Uh, but the, I do also think there's something a little bit, um, I don't know. I I wouldn't necessarily put it on social media that I got pregnant quickly and naturally um, because I feel like I would maybe be lambasted for that, for um, mm. misleading people into thinking that it would be an easy process when it's not. Right. Um, but but you did. You got you got yeah. pregnant quickly. Yeah. So within within a couple of months, really. Wow. Which, yeah, and the, the other, the flip side of it was because we were so prepared for a battle and a struggle, um, was that we were not remotely prepared to fall pregnant. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that would be the number one thing I would say to people now if they are trying later in life is, yes, it might you might face a long uphill struggle of you know IVF and all of that, and considering using a donor egg and donor sperm, but also you might get pregnant really quickly. You just, Mm -hmm. you need to be prepared for both eventualities. So we hadn't saved anything. Uh, We're still living in a one bed flat. You know, it's, we're not remotely prepared for this baby. (laughs) It will be fine. It will be fine. When is, when are you due? In June. In June? Yeah. Oh, so soon. (laughs) (laughs) Your reaction is not reassuring me. (laughs) I'm sorry. That's really quick, though. Um, tell me, I'm tell me months. about the. <laughs> tell me about your early pregnancy. How was that for you? Um, that was. I, I mean, I in I I was nauseous all the time. Yeah, I'm tired all the time. 
um I think people don't really talk about how the first trimester is the worst trimester oftentimes ah, yes um which is interesting and another thing that I I came across which I didn't expect was that I chose to tell people before I was 12 weeks people yes. that I really trusted and would tell anyway if I had a miscarriage or we decide you know it, mm. things went wrong um and I found that I got some judgment for that as well so th- th- it just seems to be there's all these things that women navigate mm-hmm. when they're pregnant which is how you're supposed to do it and if you break free from that norm then people try and push you back into that box yeah um yeah quite a few people told me that it was too early to be telling them well you know I think it goes back to what you said earlier about like that that entitlement that people have to pregnant women's bodies and the process and and maybe that goes back to you know when when people were more inclined to live in tribes and villages and, and then the babies really were everybody's, you know, like Mm -hmm. maybe just that there's that intuition because people do like, I remember just, you know, strangers touching my belly when I was pregnant, which, which was shocking to me. Um, (laughs) And, and I have the same instinct when it's somebody that I like I, I have a friend right now who's also um, British who is due in um, uh, August with a girl or late July with a girl. Um, and, you know, my hand just pops out to touch her belly every time I see her. Now, we're friends, but she didn't invite me in. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah. it's just automatic. So maybe there's something intuitive about there's this baby that we all must be that we all must take care of. And yeah. so the advice comes and the, you know, I don't know, because it, 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 it feels like people kind of lose their civility. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know what you, mean. you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I haven't, I think maybe COVID has put paid to the touching thing because I have not been touched uh, um, by yeah. anyone who I don't, I wouldn't, you know, invite it in. I wouldn't, I would allow them anyway. Right. Um, but so that I haven't had that experience. But I do think it's, yeah, it's it's probably from that community mm-hmm. caring for the baby. And so you, you want to know if it's sure. Um, but our, our, as a couple, our way of thinking about it is that we would want the support if we had a miscarriage. So right. we're going to tell the people that we would tell anyway if yes. we had a miscarriage. Um, yeah. And, yeah, we didn't expect some of the resistance that we got. We had um, a, 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 another friend of ours named Clint Chauffon, um a few weeks ago. He was the only dad talking about IVF. And he's, he's our friend, but he came on my radar because he started posting about their pregnancy journey long before she, she got pregnant, he and, his, he and his wife. And he said exactly the same thing you did, is that he would want that community support yeah. um, um, either way. You know, if the pregnancy went away or if the pregnancy stuck, they wanted their community. And and so they they raised a lot of eyebrows by sharing it the way that they did. And yeah, and he doesn't regret it at all. Um, No, I think it's entirely individual and um, people should be allowed to make their their own minds up. And also the way that the, the way that technology is advancing, we went for a scan at eight weeks. Yeah. Um, which we paid for privately because it's not very expensive here and got proof of life. And the midwife told us that now, from now on, because everything is healthy, your chances of miscarriage are actually only 2.4%, I think it was. Wow. Um, and yet after that, when I told people, you know, we've had a scan and the heartbeat's good and everything, so we we are telling some close friends and family, I was told but the miscarriage statistic is one in three. Mm. and I I didn't say anything I just took it but I did find that odd that people it it was almost like I was I was um happy and optimistic and people were trying to temper it trying to pull it down a little bit um well their own fears right yeah so it, it got to the point where I then felt like I had to preface it every time I told someone with 
obviously it might not work out and obviously it's early days and all sorts of things could go wrong but we're pregnant <laughs> right um, right so oh gosh that's a in lot order of preface to, in order to get ahead of, of all the things that they might say to try and right um, pull that down uh but we were very aware of all of the statistics and research and all of the things that could go wrong I mean I was uh, almost overly informed in that regard um so we didn't need anyone else to um remind us that's interesting so well and you know, the, the, the number one reason, according to USA Today, the number one reason women wait till after 40 to have kids is a tie between waiting for the right partner and their career. That's the number yeah. one reason. The second reason is optimism and determinism in their own, determination rather, in their own fertility. Oh, that's um, interesting. Isn't that interesting? And, yeah. and, the, and it said that those are the the article went on to say that those women are the ones that are u- usually get the most pushback because people mm-hmm. don't like to hear that optimism about their own fertility. They want them to be scared of the statistics. They want them to err on the side of caution. Um, yeah. And it sounds like you're of that mindset where you're, you've done, you've taken the responsibility, you've done the scans and, and gotten the professional medical help to say that you're okay to expect this child to be born right yeah yeah I yeah. think it's I think that's so interesting and 100% true for me the the tie between the career and meeting the right person yeah because I I yeah. didn't meet anybody necessary that I wanted to parent with apart from maybe one relationship in my late 20s which I cocked up by being a massive drinker uh, <laughs> that's another story um yeah. but I didn't meet anybody that I wanted to parent with until 40. So, and ah, we've, we've just yeah. been together for a, a year and a half, but it's just so obvious that um, mm. this is the person I want to parent with. And also I, I didn't have a secure base. You know, I, I didn't have that. Um, a lot of my friends were fortunate enough that their parents helped them get in the property ladder. I didn't have that. So I didn't buy until I was 40. Right. Um, and it was a lot of hard saving and, you know, which yeah. I managed to do by becoming an author. And that yes. took until my mid thirties to come to fruition. So mm. yeah, I wouldn't have been ready at, no. at 30 to have a baby, which was when everyone was telling me to do it. Right. Um, I would have probably gone to jail for leaving it outside a nightclub. <laughs> yes. I think that's a Tina Fey quote. I think I just nicked her joke. (laughs) We'll take it. We'll take it and use it because it's so good. And (laughs) I want to talk about sobriety, but before we switch, is there anything else you want to say about being the only over 40 mom to be in the room? Um, Just trying to think. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would say that if you, if, pardon me, if you know someone who's over 40 and they're starting to try for a baby then um allow them to be happy and excited and mm. you know don't don't try and temper that uh, because um, they already know no yes. doubt what the reality is and that it is harder so you don't need to remind them of that you know they're, I think that's they're, great. they're most likely yeah. informed so just yes. say good for you yes <laughs> yes I mean, that's all we should ever say anyway, <laughs> when, yeah. when people embark on their own journey, right? Is, yeah. Or, or say nothing, you know, yeah. if we can't muster that up, but a good for you. I like that. I, I will take that um, with me as well. And just remember that that's the important thing to do is be supportive. Yeah. In that they, they can't, they can't undo their age. Their age is right. their age. So there's no real yeah. point in reminding them of it. Um, yes. and what will be, will be. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And now I, I not, like I said, I want to switch. So my, my ex-husband's family, a lot of them were British and, um, or are there's, you know, there, a lot of them passed away. The ones that I knew, I think have passed away, but there are, there are younger ones and they're, they're still in, in the London area. And whenever they would come over to visit us in, in Los Angeles, where we are 
we were, and I still am, um, I would wake up in the morning, they'd be staying with us and they would be drinking <laughs> at what? like seven in the morning. <laughs> Whiskey. Oh um, and they would drink all day. But Catherine, let me tell you, these were the happiest people. I mean, I loved when they were around because it was so much lighter and they were so much fun, but they just never stopped drinking. And they told me that it was like, it was just British, um, mm. that this was like a British thing to do. What do you, what do you think about that? <laughs> no, that's not a British thing to do. <laughs> I mean, no, it's, it's not. I mean, I've done it, but it's definitely right. not a, a cultural widespread. Uh, what What is definitely resolutely British is going the brunch on a Sunday and I'm sure this is I'm sure brunch culture is very much the same in the US and having a Buck's Fizz or a Bloody Mary or something like that yeah, um yeah. but yeah people are definitely frowned upon for drinking in the morning here uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not widely socially accepted but people That's tend so to hide funny. it like I did um yeah right like you did <laughs> <laughs> they weren't hiding it so I really did. I, I took that to be like, okay, that's the culture. That's the British culture. Um, no. Cause they were, they were my representatives. Um, no, I mean, I would say yeah. that Irish culture is more towards mm. that. I think if you go to, um, and uh, cause I'm Irish, even though I sound very English, yes. uh, if you go to an Irish household after about 11 AM, you, yeah. you will probably be offered something stiffer than a tea. Yes. Um, you know, will you take a wee drink? <laughs> that, right. that that will be it. A wee drink. <laughs> yeah. So I, I would say Irish is boozier, but still, yeah, not 7 a.m. whiskey. That's, that's extreme. That just sounds um, like a great excuse, by the way. Right? Yes. <laughs> I would have ju- I would have jumped on that bag when I'm going to be like, yeah, this is I'm I'm going British this morning. <laughs> Right. Well, it's that that thing about well, it's five o'clock somewhere, right? Oh yeah, people, I used that like... one for a decade. <laughs> Take Absolutely. a drink. Absolutely. Um, Catherine, you've been sober since 2013. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So I'm coming up on nine years. Wow. When when's when's the month? Do you know? September. September. Mm. September. Excellent. Of course you know. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> my my um in Florida. Um, the way they they keep track of sobriety is by the month and not the day. Oh, so that's what I was thinking. But you, of course, you know the month. Like some, so, so some of the people don't know their days, but they know their month. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, what are you? Yeah. Are you seven? Um, thirteen going on fourteen. Oh my gosh, you're way ahead yeah. of me. <laughs> you're a full on teenager. Yeah. Um, Scotty and I met in in rehab almost fourteen years ago, actually. Just after Mia's birth, (laughs) that's when I was circling the drain in June of of 2008 and then went to treatment in July of 2008. You guys have got Mia. Yeah. Isn't that that your daughter's? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So when, after she's born, that'll be my, I'll be turning 14. Oh, Um, I see. Oh, okay. I've got you. All right. I thought thought you had a daughter called Mia. (laughs) <laughs> no, no, no. And I didn't know. Is it okay to say that? I just, that just popped out. Do you want me not, not to oh, have no, your no, daughter's I'm name? Oh, no, no. I'm happy. I'm okay. more than happy. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> She's an open book. She's an open book. I am. <laughs> um, Literally. So you wrote, you wrote something. I just wanted to read it really quick because I, I love this. Um, you, you wanted to send out the message that being a teetotal is a privilege, a prize to be won, a joyful lifestyle choice rather than a cross to bear or a failure or a loss. And I, I just love that. So can you just tell us a little bit? I, we only have like 10 minutes left, but I want to hear um, like why you got sober and then what it's been like for you. Why, why, why this? Why a joyful lifestyle choice mm. rather than a cross to bear? Yeah. So one of the reasons, and I'm sure you would identify with this because, you know, you're 13 going on 14, but but now sobriety is very much a changed landscape. It, it feels yes. much more, um, it feels almost cool. You yeah. know, it, well, it does feel cool in the UK. It's, it's, a, it's a badge. People love it. They, they will mm. crow about being teetotal and sober now. Um, but it wasn't the case in 2012, 2013. So I yeah. really resisted it. 
and really thought that it was going to be the end of my social life and me feeling relaxed and free and friendly and any of those positive warm vibes I really thought that it would just mean that I would spend the rest of my life uptight but you know I'd be able to pay my bills and wouldn't get fired from my job and my family might continue to speak to me (laughs) so uh, it felt like a very necessary but boring decision uh, Mm. because I was 100% physically and psychologically addicted you know I was drinking seven eight bottles of wine a week and Mm. also drinking in the morning to stop the shakes so I was yeah definitely an eight or nine on on the scale so it was a no-brainer to quit but I didn't want to (laughs) I didn't think that it was going to lead to all this joy and happiness and freedom emancipation so when Mm. I found that it did I just felt this urge to write a book about it and tell other people because I didn't feel like there were any other books that did that and that's how the book, The Unexpected Joy of Being Sober, was born. Yes, and burst upon the scene. Yeah. Which is, I mean, it really did. And that whole, the, so what are what are the names, the titles in the in the series? Unexpected Joy of Being Sober, um, mm-hmm. Unexpected Joy of Being Single, and yes. Unexpected Joy of the Ordinary. The Ordinary. Yes. yes. Well, you know, and I read this somewhere, I think it was the New York Times, um, within within an article about sobriety that it's not tragedy that what that creates a need for people to drink again after a period of sobriety for the most part it's boredom yeah it, or it's like euphoria. people get, yeah yes feeling invincible and yeah tell me tell me like how you made your life not boring like because you were afraid you weren't going to be social that you weren't going to be fun you'll be uptight and and putting down the drink is is scary. What did you what did you substitute it with? Well, I discovered when I went sober that I'm actually an introvert anyway, and I really like being at home oh. <laughs> by myself. Yeah. So even though I, I'm I am quite extroverted as well, I I do like to go out. It wasn't as big a sacrifice as I thought it would be, and okay. I discovered that the reason I was going out three or four nights a week, you know, out, out, big nights, uh, was because I wanted to drink, not necessarily yes. that I wanted to go out. So yeah. I rediscovered this layer of me that had been buried since I was a teen, um, mm. you know, reading, cuddling up with dogs, going for long walks in the forest, things that I'd love doing as a kid, um, cycling, you know, all of those things that I still love to do. So it was right. like I discovered this layer beneath the nightlife that um, gave me joy anyway. Wow. I love that. So like you had departed from your authentic self in the pursuit of drinking, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And there's, yeah. A, there's a whole chapter in the book called Death of Party Girl. And I really yes. mourned her because I yeah. was a party girl and I was the party starter and the first one on the dance floor and the, the person that was invited because they were going to do something raucous and ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And so when that, when I stopped drinking, I really did mourn that, that person because I wasn't her right. anymore. Yeah. So that was part of the process. And it's important to um, acknowledge that, that there is a grief in, in it as well as a joy. Yeah. Do you, um, do you ever miss it? Honestly, you... no, 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 not now. I mean, yeah. if you'd asked me in the first few years, I yeah. would have said yes. And mm. then after that, I think what I missed was that fast lane, that easy, quick fix that goes yes. from uptight to relaxation, because you can meditate and exercise and all the things, but it's it's still easier to sling a glass of wine down and that takes you to relax it's mm-hmm. more effort to get relaxed organically the other ways even though now I would you know 100% choose those ways right. so it's it's something that we all lean on far too much to segue from work day to evening relaxed I, I would say yeah I completely I mean obviously I agree but I I think I'd agree with that even if I weren't sober and then um 
I was thinking we had another guest who's also a friend of ours. She wrote this book called Sippy Cups Are Not for Chardonnay. Yeah. And and she really started the whole mommy wine culture um, here in the States anyway. Um, she's she's sober now. She's sober for a while. But this is this is something, you know, that that a lot of moms find is that they get overwhelmed by this new baby and they need some relief. I don't know if you're thinking about projecting that far into the future about how you'll find that relief with a new baby. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah it's going to be difficult. I have thought about it because I, yeah. the, what my go-to would be running out and going for a run or going to yoga yes. or going yeah. paddle boarding. And I'm not going to be able to do that. So I'm going right. to need to find that within myself. And I know from what other people have told me that I'm going to be tested to the nth degree. Um, yeah. I think I'm going to have to meditate my ass off. Yeah. <laughs> you'll be levitating when you're meditating <laughs> yeah absolutely but I, and I do think it's a really good thing that I am nearly nine years sober and going into this process because yeah. I would imagine it topples many many people um if sure. they've just got a couple of years under the belt because you know it's it's a tough thing to do so um yeah I'll find my way through it I'm sure but I know it will be challenging yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's when I started drinking alcoholically, that was the beginning for me, was after my kids were born. And I mean, it didn't start off like that, of course, but that's where it ended up. And I, it, I felt so entitled to it, you know, mm-hmm. and, and justified it and rationalized it and minimized it. Um, and I just, you know, not that I, I regret my life. And I, I really, I need to say that because I, I don't, I don't regret the, the journey that's brought me to where I am. But if I were to give somebody something for them to do differently, it would have been to prepare for that the way that yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. To absolutely. really just think ahead. Yeah. I think what you just said is so interesting because so many of my friends and I also thought that motherhood would cure my hard drinking. And yes. the truth is often the exact opposite you're suddenly at home all day, you are really going through the most stressful thing. And it's just so easy to start drinking earlier and earlier. And so it's, it's that process that actually, instead of it um, stopping you being a party girl, you just become somebody who drinks at home. So yeah, Yeah. it's something that I'm very aware of. Um, Mm -hmm. And also there's the whole, you know, alcohol as a parenting aid, you deserve it. Culture. Um, yes. I've, I've heard some horrific stories there's some in here actually there's a whole um thing on um parents talking about experiences they've had like prosecco fueled play dates and even yes. wine clinking under push chairs in the park and being offered wine at 11 a.m in the park and mm-hmm. uh, there's also a chapter from pregnant women who felt that like they were pushed into drinking when they were pregnant so yes it's, yes. it's a real thing <laughs> it really is yeah. Um, parenting and alcohol are just so inextricably intertwined and um, it's just a massive marketing campaign which is yes. aimed at you know big alcohol want to keep their consumer even after you've had kids yes like let's let's get that market because yeah. <laughs> I mean and 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 just what you said people people will allow that and they do want you to just oh you could have one drink it's yeah. okay yeah. It won't harm the baby. Yeah. Um, people, you know, anybody that's drinking wants you to drink with them, period. Like that's, that's just the way it goes. So it's, um, it is, it is the, the beautiful thing for me um, is that I don't know that I really had the choices then. I don't know that I was able to make choices then in the way that I am now. I have so many choices now. I can walk away. I can, um, I can meditate, like you said. I, I I have choices to how I can act. Once I take a drink, my choices diminish. Hi, I'm Catherine Gray, and I'm the only over forty mom to be in the room.